Jumps to the Kingdom. I am David Pendergrass. One question I receive fairly often through the years is, will we be married in heaven? Or those, of course, who are married, will they be married in heaven? The world to come? It's a good question. And it's interesting that uh, there is actual reference to this in the New Testament. Now, it's, first, I think it's important to remember that the New Testament doesn't say a whole lot, quite frankly, about the world to come. And by the world to come, I mean what it would be like in the world to come. When a person dies now, and if they go to be with Jesus, we'll call that the heavenly realm. We'll be in heaven. Call it, that's If you want to use that word, that's, that's okay. But that's not the end goal. The end goal is when he makes a new heavens and new earth. Jesus specifically says this. He talks about a resurrection body in controversy with the certain religious leadership, which we'll talk about in just a second. But this is the basic assumption of Paul's theology and other New Testament authors. It is not in every New Testament document, but it is a basic assumption that there's going to be a new heaven and new earth, just as, of course, Revelation, John the prophet quotes from Isaiah when he says that. So the heavenly realm is a when we die now is not the final goal. Our goal is not to be roaming souls with no body. God's goal is that we get a new body in the world to come. So what happens when we die right now? Okay, I'm married right now. Let's say I died right now and Elaine is still alive on earth. Well, then of course, I'm not married to her anymore. Uh, in that sense, I mean, you could be, but I, I'm dead. So I'm dead, which all dead means is my soul has left its body and I will be alive again when I get a new body. And that's exactly what happened with Jesus. Jesus was dead in that his soul left his body and he got a new body, which is why he's alive. He's alive and well. It's when his soul and his body is reunited that he's resurrected. Well, do Christian, do human beings, will human beings stay married? Uh, for the Christian perspective, the Christian perspective is uh, no. And the reason why the Christian perspective is no is because even though the New Testament isn't very clear about what it will be like in heaven or the world to come, Jesus actually does talk about this specific issue. I wish he talked about a lot of issues. <laughs> I wish he did. I mean, Islam talks a lot about that. Uh, Judaism speculates a good bit about that, not in, the, not in the time period of the New Testament. But the New Testament doesn't say a whole lot, but about this one, it sure does. In fact, it's in Matthew chapter 22. In Matthew chapter 22, we know that Jesus, who didn't have a bunch of friends everywhere, the Sadducees come up to him. And the Sadducees, who were well-known religious elites around Jerusalem, they were mostly from the Sadducees or where the priests uh, were selected from. They were from that group, the Sadducees. and But not all of them. But anyway, uh, as far as I remember, not all of them. But anyway, they come up to Jesus and they asked him, Teacher, this is in chapter 22, verse 24, Matthew 22, 24. Moses said, If a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and the father of children for his brother. Now, of course, he's alluding to the fact that this is what happens, what's called a, the, the Levite marriage. Uh, it's from Deut He's quoting Deuteronomy 25.5. I say he. Um, it's, uh, you know, a person from the Sadducees. Quotes Deuteronomy 25.5. This practice, it, it, like I said, is called the Levite marriage. And this shows up in Ruth 4.1.12. It's in the Mishnah. It's in Josephus and so forth. But a Levite marriage uh, means basically the brother-in-law. So when the brother of a man died and he had a son, he had the obligation to marry his brother's widow. Now, of course, there's no child care in the ancient world or, or Medicare or Social Security. It's a way to make sure that she's not dead broke. I mean, it's just that it, it really is to make sure that she can be sustained and be taken care of. It's a very ancient Jewish custom. It's a very caring custom that their brother-in-law would take care of uh, the, the now the widow and the children. And so they're quoting the Bible to Jesus, and the assumption is, Jesus, you must not know your Bible, because uh, we're going to use this against the resurrection. He says, now, there were seven brothers among us. So, so the little Sadducees give a little parable. They give an example they're trying to trick Jesus on. They say, there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died. Since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The second did the same. The third down to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had married her. Because the point is, she kept remarrying, 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 remarrying. And she was being obedient, and the brothers were being obedient to what you know they would say God said in Deuteronomy. And the point is, they're trying to trick them. Whose will she be? If resurrection is true, you have a problem on your hands, Jesus, because she can't be married to seven different brothers simultaneously. And Jesus says, answered, you are deceived because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. 
And of course, meaning you don't know all the scriptures. Other scriptures uh, give us uh, information on this. Or the power of God, meaning God can do what he wants to do. He has the ability to fix this. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. That's verse 30, 22, 30. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And then he goes on for the resurrection. Now as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what is spoken to you by God? I am the father, God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, or Yisak, the God of Yaakov. And of course, quoting Exodus 3, 6. He's not the God of the dead, but the living. When the crowds heard this, they were amazed at his teaching. Now Jesus, he interprets Exodus 3, 6 in a way that, as far as I know, no other Jews were doing. <laughs> for Jesus to use the Exodus passage as example that they are alive and well, and they must have been resurrected, um, is, as far as I can tell, novel in the history of Jewish interpretation. And But Jews had no problem taking the Bible verses to mean what they want to mean. And that's what Jesus does here. But I'm going to go back to the marriage. That's verse 30. They neither marry nor are given in marriage. And that's the Christian worldview. I mean, that's it. Let me say something real brief, quickly. That this, this is absolutely against Mormonism. Joseph Smith argued that we are, in fact, married. We stay married. And then you populate your own planet. And you become basically like an Adam and Eve of your own planet and have a bunch of all babies. And everyone descends from you. And that's one of the big selling points for Mormonism. They'll say, "Don't you? do you love your spouse? Do you want to stay loving with your spouse forever? Well, sign up today in Mormonism and you can be married forever and ever and ever. That's explicitly against the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. You have to choose whether Joseph Smith is your authority or Jesus is your authority. You can't have both on this issue for sure. Jesus says, when people are resurrected, they're not married and they don't get, go into marriage. But they're like angels in heaven. Now, what does that mean? Well, first of it means we're not married. It means I will not be married to my wife. When I die, my soul leaves my body and I go into heavenly realms. And then one day I receive a resurrected body. Well, my wife and I, my wife Elaine, when Elaine and I see each other in the world to come, it means we will no longer be married. We're not in a marriage relationship, according to Jesus. It also means if you are single on this earth, you don't get married in the world to come. Now, what's the assumption there? The assumption probably is because Jews had a lot of assumption about angels. Uh, and that is one thing is that angels aren't married. Why is that? Because angels don't have children. And that is the primary function of marriage within Judaism. The primary function of marriage is progeny, carrying on your kinfolk. And that's what you don't need to do because angels, why? Because the assumption in Judaism, angels live forever. They don't die. You don't need to carry on your name. You don't need to carry on progeny. You live, angels live forever unless God chooses to make them cease to exist. But they don't need to have children to keep surviving. And Jesus is saying it's like that when you're resurrected. Since you will live forever, you don't need babies, which means you don't need to be married. Marriage is for having children. Now, that does not fit our modern American Western uh, sentimental romanticism of wait a second it's about falling in love and kissing and loving and and jesus says no it's not no it's not i mean that's that's not the reason why people get married um that's not the main function of marriage in general david does that mean you're not married if you don't have children no jews ancient jews would stay stay married even if they could have children it just means the institution the general practice of marriage is to bear children. In general, that is true. And that's, in general, what people do when they get married. And in general, that's what happens. And in Judaism, it would say that's that's what God wanted humans in general to do. But Jews could be single all of their lives. It wasn't that common, but they could be single. They weren't less than citizens or sinners just because they stayed single. No more than Christians today are sinners or less than if they're single. So what? The point is, when you're resurrected, you don't get married. It's not like, well, I looked and looked and looked for a spouse. Don't worry. Jesus will make sure you get your spouse in the world to come. No, you won't. Yeah, I mean, that's the way it is. If you're married now, uh, great, but you won't be married in the world to come. You won't need to have children. You'll live forever. Well, David, does that mean I will know my spouse? I'm convinced you will know your spouse. I'm convinced you will even know you're married. I think when I see my wife after we both die and I'll see her, I will know very clearly that was my wife. We were married. It will mean, however, that romantic, erotic love will no longer be part of our relationship. 
erotic romantic love well now and i'm so glad to have erotic romantic love i'm so glad that my wife feels that way toward me what, what? i'm glad i had that toward my wife yes i i'm so glad for that it just means in the world to come i won't have it and people say isn't that sad well, i don't think it's sad i think we won't feel sad at all i think we'll be nothing but absolutely joyful i think and everyone who's mature Christian, I think, has a sense of this, will know this, that real good Christian marriage is not predicated upon romantic erotic love. It's awesome to have it, but that Lord knows that's not the reason why I got married, nor why I stay married. Feelings of romantic love, or eros, they come and go. Okay, so what? I mean, who gives a rip? My commitment to my wife is a commitment to my wife. It's not a, a commitment to my feelings about my wife. And in the world to come... The agape, consistent, unconditional love and concern for my wife's good that I experience now will be fulfilled. It will be in its fullest sense. And I'll have that fuller, fullest, phenomenal sense of love toward all people. And so will Elaine have a special place in my heart? I imagine she will. I mean, we're best friends. I guess kind of. She's about fifth on the list. And uh, <clears throat> I'm just kidding. So great friends. I think we'll be great friends there. I think I will know her very well, and I will love her completely and fully, and I think we won't have a need for erotic or romantic love, and therefore we won't have it. We won't be married, we won't have children. Uh, all the children we have now, we have three, one is already waiting on us in the world to come, or at least in heaven. <clears throat> he or she is waiting, and we'll get to meet him or her, and we have two right now, and the three we have, well, I will know them specially. They will always be my biological children. But chiefly, they are my brothers and sisters in Christ now, because both my children now are Christians, and I will love them fully as well. I won't be loving them just because they're my flesh and blood. In other words, that won't be a component. Will be a comp well, the chief component will be is they're now children of God, and I will love them as children of God. They will love me as children of, as a child of God fully. I, I won't need the other. There just won't be a need for it. Thanks for listening so far. I'll be right back. It's amazing how much in life we have to deal with money. Well, in the ancient world, they didn't have a lot of money. They used money for taxes and a few other things. But we can learn a lot about how the early Christians used their money and their possessions. If you want a good, quick, short study on some key texts in the New Testament of how the earliest Christians used money, I encourage you to check out the book I wrote called Give It Away. It's on Amazon.com. Give It Away. It's a wonderful study to use for small groups. There are discussion questions in the chapters already written for you. This is a spectacular thing you can use for your church. I hope you'll check it out. Hey, not everybody can be a biblical scholar or an apologist. And I understand that. Everyone understands it. So we have to use good resources to help us save us a lot of time and give us things to think about and maybe some data, a good starting point. If I might be so bold, I would encourage you to read my book, A Skeptic Challenges a Christian. A Skeptic Challenges a Christian on Amazon.com. You can check it out today. It's not expensive. So far, praise God, the reviews have been great. You can use it for small group study, Bible studies, whatever you want. And I think it's going to help encourage you and equip you. Perhaps even a skeptic you know. Maybe you can purchase the book for them. It's in multiple formats. You can listen to the book, Kindle, paperback, whatever it might be. I think it'll bless you. Would you like Dr. Pendergrass to come visit your church? He could speak and provide classes and training on multiple topics. Visit davidpendergrass.com for more information. Have you visited davidpendergrass.com recently? There are some great things that you can share with your friends. Okay, let's pick back up where I left off. Uh, well, that's really it. I mean, <laughs> there's no really, <laughs> there's no big therefore. So if you're single now in this life, okay, if you want to get married, wonderful. The clock's ticking. No pressure. I'm just, I'm just I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. Uh, well, David, what if I, when I'm single and I want to get married in this world to come? Well, God give me a spouse just because he, he wants us to be married. Well, my response is I'm not convinced God wants all people to be married. I'm not convinced of that at all. Jesus never elevated married people. He never elevated single people. Remember, we'll go, if we go back and read your Matthew and, and, um, Matthew, well, anyway, it's all over the place. Uh, I won't go there right now, but I've said this in other podcasts. But Jesus had no problem saying some are married, some are not. Some are eunuchs uh, for the kingdom of God, meaning some people are just, they choose to be single for 
maybe religious reasons or maybe whatever. I mean, I, you know, some people just, you know, there's all kinds of reasons why a person would be single and they're not for one second or they're less than married people. Um, it's about being a disciple of Jesus, not about being a married disciple of Jesus, but it'll be about disciple of Jesus. If it's about being a married disciple of Jesus, then Jesus was a horrible teacher because he was single. I mean, that's okay. If he were single, then it can't be bad to be a single at all. But anyway, that's it. Think on such things. Well, the conversation isn't finished. You can always reach out to me on social media. Are you on Facebook? I am too. At Glimpse of the Kingdom. Glimpse of the Kingdom on Facebook. Be sure to like it and you can see updates there. Also, if you're on Twitter, check me out at at Dr. D. Pendergrass. At Dr. D. Pendergrass. Or at Glimpse the King. At Glimpse the King. And I try my best to respond to comments and questions on there as quickly as I can. If you want more, there are many more resources on the podcast and my blog. Go to my website, davidpendergrass.com, davidpendergrass.com, and you can see a full list of the podcast, and my blog is available for free. Are you active in a church right now? I'd be happy to come out to your church and do all kinds of classes and workshops there. Check out davidpendergrass.com, davidpendergrass.com for more information. And may God in his great grace give you even just a glimpse of his kingdom this week. See you next time.